This is Kiev. This is the city I was born in. My name is Vitaly Kurotic. I'm a poet. This is the city where I live. Even if you've never been here, you must have heard that it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The city which has endured down the ages and preserved its beauty. Here in this fine city, there are places connected with the gory pages of its history. Places where everything is going dark before your eyes and your anguished heart beats rapidly as you walk down these streets which are among the most sorrowful in history, among the most deeply engraved in human memory. Это очень старый город, одна из колыбелей славянской цивилизации. И если бы я вам сейчас... It is a very old city, one of the cradles of Slavic civilization. And if I were to tell you now its whole history, it would unavoidably be interwoven with the histories of very kind and wise people who planted all these trees and built all the houses here. It would be interwoven with the stories about how attempts were made from time to time to annihilate all the people who live here. The last time an attempt was made to annihilate me, a Ukrainian, and most of the people you can see around. At the time I was a boy, and it was planned that in the 50s I would not live here. It was planned that none of those who lived here before the war should be left among the living. And this film is also about how nobody could defeat the revolution, the memory, the life from which we had emerged, and for whose sake we took up arms. These Germans were born before World War II. They would yet become orphans. The walls of burning Berlin will yet fall on them. Their parents would not come back from the war. Hitler would do it. He would credit them with their ancestors' crimes, describing them as glorious exploits. He would raise killers. He would send them to kill us. All this began with the killing of conscience, with the killing of memory, morals, principles. Hitlers emerge when there is someone who is willing to pay for them. When the need arises to buy a person who will push the button and send the armies to kill and plunder. This is how they started off. The ashes of their future victims were already whispering under their feet. This is a lesson to be remembered for centuries. 
And that is why we should learn from it. We should all learn from it. The more so that the American neo-Nazis, and not only them, brazenly assert today and write on their posters, Hitler was right. Because they're waiting, they're looking for their own Hitler. These Nazis were drilled on a parade ground in Hitler's time. And they're marching now. They march like this, not only in Cologne or Munich. They make grimaces, put on asses' heads and march along sporting the posters like this one. I'm an ass because I believe that Oradour, Treblinka, Babiar had really existed. This is how they were entering Kiev. By that time, they had set half the world on fire. Entering the smoke-shrouded city, they already knew that this would be the site of Babi Yar. They had planned to start with it. Kiev had never had it so bad. We're telling you about Babi Yar because it was the most flagrant experiment in mass murder. An experiment they hoped nobody would learn about. Here's a notice. They were searching for this man. They were afraid that he would be able to tell the truth about them. When they drove us into Babi Yar and chained us, I understood that my last minute had come. All my comrades shared the same thought. Oh God, if only one of us could survive this massacre, he would tell people about these horrors, about what was going on here. These people remained alive. They're among us today. They broke through the Nazis' cordon. Then their number was 327. Only 14 of them escaped, and only six, one Ukrainian and five Jews, have lived to this day to tell us their story. Because it is vitally important for us to know, for the world to remember the lesson of Babi Yar. I would tell you that it's a very beautiful locality if it were not Babi Yar. Perhaps as long as Kiev exists, no one will ever say that these are picturesque slopes, beautiful trees, because the roots of each tree grow through the remains of thousands of people slaughtered here in this black Babi Yar this horrible ravine. They packed into it nearly 200,000 human bodies. It is essential that the world should know how they did it and how they dread today the memory of their crimes. Right here in this Babi Yar stood the furnaces. The stench was unbearable. We were ordered to carry the bodies and under pain of summary execution to stack them on the platform of the furnace. Here they brought people, naked women and children, put to death in mobile gas chambers. They wanted to break us by killings. They didn't know any other punishment, and they killed for no reason at all, for pigeons. For picking up a helmet. They killed simply because you were a Ukrainian, a Russian, a Jew, a Kazakh, because you were a Soviet. The Road of Death. That is what it was called since the Nazis entered Kiev on September 19, 1941. An endless stream of people began to flow down this road on September 29th. 
fascists were driving them to the slaughter. For the first five days, they were killing predominantly Jews. During the following 745 days of the Nazi occupation, day after day, they shot here our prisoners of war, communists, resistance fighters, sailors of the Dnieper flotilla, making no distinction among nationalities because the victims were Soviet and the killers were fascists. Babi Yar is the height of inhumanity. It is one of the biggest and most horrible common graves in history. Here is one of the typical notices. All the Jews of Kiev and its suburbs are to come to the corner of Melnikov and Dikhtarov streets near the cemetery at 6 a.m. Monday, September 29, 1941. It is necessary to bring along documents, money, and valuables, as well as warm clothes, linen, etc. Whoever of the Jews fails to carry out this order and will be found elsewhere will be shot on sight. We came out into Artyom Street. We found ourselves in a huge stream of people. There were so many people, children, old men and women, cripples. Some of them were riding. Others walked, carrying suitcases in their hands. Everyone was thinking about a long journey. And no wonder considering that we were moving in the direction of the railway station branch. Suddenly, my sister got into a fuss. Mother, she said, we've left the salt behind. How can we go without salt on a journey? We were all thinking only about the journey. We came up to Dorogozhitskaya Street. We saw a number of trucks that were moving towards us. There were lots of suitcases and other belongings on the trucks. The free space on the trucks was occupied by the Germans. They roared with laughter looking at us. And I said to my mother, Mom, don't worry. Nothing bad will happen to us. Nothing bad. But then why are the soldiers with the German shepherds standing there? Why are they taking away documents photos, personal belongings. Nothing bad. But then why this wild screaming and children crying? Further on, the fascists made people strip naked. Once they brought to the concentration camp a truck full of children's clothes. We were taken to sort them. We were sorting them out and crying. And we thought, how many small children had the fascists murdered so as to gather a truckload of clothing? This pain will never go away. Even today, mankind shudders with horror, thinking of the number of children they massacred. The children were enemies of the Reich, because they might have grown up to become Soviet people. It was easy to kill children. One only had to take them away from their mothers. the last steps in their short lives. The site was surrounded with hills. Between the hills were passages. 
into which the Nazis drove people. The incessant rattle of gunfire was coming from there. Even now, I can visualize a woman on the site with two little children. They were only about five. They clung to their mother's legs and shouted, Mommy, I don't want to die. They who were trying to terrorize entire nations, they themselves lived in a constant fear of vengeance. This sequence was shot soon after the liberation of Kiev at the first trial of war criminals. They ordered us to go, except we were not stripped. It was dark already. They took us to that same sand door. We entered. They lined us up on the ledge, which was so small that we couldn't get much of a footing on it. They began shooting us. I shut my eyes, clenched my fists, tensed all my muscles, and took a plunge down before the bullets hit me. It seemed I was flying forever, but I landed safely on the bodies. After a while, when the shooting stopped, I heard the Germans climbing into the ravine. They started finishing off all those who were not dead yet, those who were moaning, hiccuping, tossing, writhing in agony. They ran their flashlights over the bodies and finished off all who moved. I was lying so still without stirring, terrified of giving myself away. I felt I was done for. I decided to keep quiet. They started covering the corpses over with earth. They must have put quite a lot over me because I felt I was beginning to suffocate, but I was afraid to move. I was gasping for breath. I knew I would suffocate. Then I decided it was better to be shot than buried alive. I stirred, but I didn't know that it was quite dark already. Using my left arm, I managed to move a little way up. Then I took a deep breath summoned up my waning strength and crawled out from under the cover of earth. It was dark, but all the same, it was dangerous to crawl because the searching beams of flashlight and the continued shooting at those who moaned. They might hit me, so I had to be careful. I was lucky enough to crawl up one of the high walls of the ravine and straining every nerve and muscle got out of it. Goering, speaking at the Nuremberg trial, exclaimed, no one will believe that so many people could have been killed. And he was confronted there with Bobby Yar as one of the most blood-curdling arguments of the prosecution, one of the major crimes against humanity. These are the people who are running the machine of mass murder. The murderers will hang, justice will triumph, but the dead will never know about the execution of a few from the pack of killers. The smallpox of concentration camps afflicted Europe. It was one of the most dreadful diseases that had ever hit mankind. They waged their war as a war against a certain ideology. Extreme nationalists, they showed the extent of depravity of their virulent chauvinism. Chauvinism is equally wicked, whether you call it anti-Semitism, apartheid in South Africa, or Zionism of today's rulers of Israel. Rabid nationalism strives to distort the causes of class contradictions and to replace class struggle between the oppressors 
and the voiceless and exploited masses with the myth of the blood, of the inferiority of one nation compared with another. These persons are also grading mankind by the color of the skin. They're doing it today. Their neo-Nazi poster demands white power. Fascism is alive. It has gained wide experience.
today, from the distance of our memory, we recall all the 20 million citizens of our country who gave their lives for the great victory. The war tragedy still rankles. Их было очень много, пленных, которых мы брали из разбитой вражеской армии. И среди этих людей были не только ведь немцы. We captured a great many prisoners of war. Among them were not only Germans. When they passed the streets of our cities, the water used for washing off their tracks ran not only into the sewerage system. Unfortunately, part of this dirty water found its way across the ocean. Если делать такой фильм, вот как мы делали... Working on this film, we had to look through thousands of meters of newsreels and other documentary material. We had to examine thousands of photographs. Here in front of me are only some of them. The chief of Kyiv Ukrainian police during the Nazi occupation, a Mr. Kabaida. He fled this country and found refuge overseas. He signed orders about executions of Jews, Ukrainians and Russians specifically in Babiyar. He even set a price on the head of each captured Jew. Here is a document signed by Kabaida. I make special mention of Cossack Yosef Kirichuk, who, while off duty, detained a Jew. For this deed, he is rewarded with one kilo of lard and one kilo of flour. As a token of appreciation of the services of the Ukrainian police, the grateful occupationists even renamed one of the downtown streets. The alliance of enemies is always instructive. Today Zionists are ready to embrace those who yesterday organized pogroms. Today they chew the same gum and the same words. Today we see the merging of all anti-Soviet forces. They are very different in political coloring, but they are united by their pathological hatred for the Soviet Union. They want us to forget that in the not-so-distant past, their banners fluttered alongside the Nazi standards, and their emblems matched so well with the Nazi swastikas, the signs which came to be associated with the tragedies like that of Babi Yar. I do believe that those who escape punishment must fear you, the people who are watching this film right now. They must know that they've not been forgiven for the crimes they committed. They must know that the human destinies they cut short, the lives they cut short, hang over them and give them no peace, not for a moment. And should we forget about the criminals, we will not be forgiven by their victims. Those who stayed in Babi Yar forever will never forgive us, and they will be right.
they wanted us to forget everything. But we're making this film because we have not forgotten anything. On August 18th, 1943, 100 inmates of the Ceres concentration camp were taken to Babi Yar. I was one of them. At first, we thought that they had brought us there to be shot. As it turned out, that was not the case. They chained us and ordered to open one of the ditches in Babi Yar. We found there masses of human bodies. We noticed at once that the Germans were launching a large-scale operation. They had brought a powerful excavator, a compressor, and barrels of fuel. They had begun to lay a narrow-gauge railway. The Germans graded us according to speciality. The first group was called Kreba, that is, diggers. The second was called Hackenschlepper, that is, carriers who used long iron hooks. The third was called Knochenbrecher, that is, bone crushers. The fourth was called Goldsucher, that is, gold diggers. We opened huge graves, stacked disinterred corpses on the platforms of furnaces, each accommodating about two or two and a half thousand bodies. By our estimates, approximately 125,000 corpses were cremated there. Kiev, the city is 1,500 years old. In the summer of 1941, its population was 900,000. Two years later, in 1943, it was reduced to less than 200,000. The fascist death in there never stopped. They added new bodies to those that had been in the grave for two years. The Nazis brought their new victims in mobile gas chambers, and we had to throw the bodies which were still warm, into the fire. Some of our comrades couldn't stand it and went mad. They were shot there and then, and their bodies were thrown into the fire. But new workforce kept arriving from the camp. The Nazis made us search the corpses. We were looking for valuables and we found various things in the pockets. Once I was lucky, I found the key which fitted the lock in our dugout. Just think, the key to the rescue of the living was kept in the pockets of the dead. On September 28th, I happened to overhear one of the guards saying in German, Tomorrow, we're going to do away with these gentlemen. And then we understood why they did not charge the last furnace. We rushed out of the dugout. The guards were taken aback and momentarily paralyzed. There were several armed SS men in our way. Random shots were fired and flares shot up. But we were running away from Badiga. New fire worshippers of sorts have taken up the torch from their precursors. It's really sickening to see them rejoice over any mean trick they pulled off, over any smear they made against the country which proclaimed internationalism and equality of nations and races.
in their own way. They even diversify Hitler's experience. In Chile, they turn a stadium into a babia. The trial of this man, who destroyed a city in Italy, lasted for 20 years. The prison gates open and the Nazis are set free. Nazism should be stopped. It shall not pass. The murderers shall not pass. The world must become better. It must survive. It must be suitable for human life. Our country has repeatedly spelled that out and once again calls for peace among nations. In this work for peace, we see the meaning of our life. so much in humanity in the world. And Babi Yar, like a sharp boundary, reaches over time, spans time. But they go to any length trying to erase our memory of those who lost their lives in the war. They're trying to put a boundary between the past and the present. They divide in order to rule, to rule over memory. This is the monument we have raised in Babi Yar. This bronze, like a huge bell, calls for unity. We did everything in our power to prevent Bobby R. from stretching over the Atlantic and reaching America. We did everything we could to prevent the Nazis from landing in Britain, from destroying that country. The rash of Bobby R.'s was to cover the body of the entire world. It first appeared on the body of our country only because it was here that they encountered the strongest resistance. It was here that they were confronted with the greatest force which they had to smash before they could start digging Babi Yars around the world. We reflect on the lessons of Babi Yar because we do not want the repetition of the tragedy. In the third millennium, nobody should ever face foreign guns and fall under a hail of bullets. Those who have never been shot at should remember their fellow humans who became earth, air, memory. They should remember how we broke the back of the fascist hordes, how we defeated the forces of darkness to ensure the triumph of humanity, peace, and joy on earth. This is a monument to Babi Yar, to my city, and to all other cities that survived the war.